Hey everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, June 22nd, 2014. The show should be called The Young and the Restless and the Paternity Twist. <laughs> We've got paternity twists inside of paternity twists. If there is one thing that this show knows how to do, it's a paternity storyline. We are all up in it. At the beginning of the week, Dylan is just starting to realize that, oh, he's a match for Paul's rare blood type. What a weird coincidence. <laughs> uh, he might be able to be a, an appropriate donor for Paul to save his life. And Nikki immediately assumes that, yes, well, if Dylan is a blood match, then he is 100% going to be able to donate his part of his kidney. He is going to be able to save Paul's life, and Nikki cannot wait to tell Christine. You remember Christine, Paul's wife? Where was Christine at the beginning of the week when all of this was going down? She was completely missing from the hospital. I don't know if they said she was sleeping or something, but somebody go wake her up. If you found a potential match even, let her know. And obviously, as the week went on, that hope would be dashed, but still, I think that Christine is not as involved in all of this as she should be. I want to, I mean, if Paul is in the hospital lying on his deathbed, I want Christine in every scene. I want Christine at every scene in the hospital. I want to see her beautiful and makeupless and worried. And every time Nikki is there, I want Christine to be there giving her the evil eye. <laughs> I mean, Nikki has spent twice as much time at the hospital as Christine has. I don't get it. Nikki's there by Paul's bedside telling him that Dylan is a potential match. That should have been Christine there telling him about the potential match. If YNR wants to believe, wants to make us believe that this couple's married, even though Laura Lee Bell is not even in the credits, she's kind of a contract, or she's not on contract, she seems like she's sort of just uh, freelancing, I don't know, sort of on the show every once in a while. Like, you're gonna need to at least make me believe that they're a couple. <laughs> it's just so bizarre. Um, I mean, and that's not to say that I didn't enjoy Nikki and Paul connecting. Nikki's sitting there by his bedside, and she has this lovely flashback of them being very, very young and um, in love, and Paul telling her that he's, I think, I think he said, you're the first or only girl that I've ever had these feelings for, and Nikki feels the same way about him, and it was so, it's just cool to see these two characters, Nikki and Paul, who I've known the entire time I've been watching YNR. I don't think there's ever been a time where they haven't been on the show. It's so cool to look back at that flashback and to see where we are now and how close the actors must be. And it's, it is, I, that's one thing that I love about YNR is that they really have cultivated the actors that they have. And you can dip out of YNR if that's the kind of viewer you are. You can choose not to watch it for a year or more, more. And you can come back and the, they're still the same characters still going through their same struggles. It's one thing I like and love about the show and it is clear that Nikki not only loves Paul, but she has a history with Paul. In some ways, he is her oldest, possibly one of her dearest friends. And now we're learning that they also share a son together. <laughs> I can tell you right now, Victor is not going to like this. <laughs> he is not going to be happy. He is starting to come to a point of accepting Dylan as her son. I don't know if he's going to be as able to accept that she shares this son with Paul. I think this is going to be a truth that is difficult for everyone to accept. Um, Avery is there to support Dylan. She's not exactly happy about the fact that he is trying to become a living donor for Paul. She doesn't want to lose Dylan. In fact, she said something um, 
gosh, it was toward the end of the week she said, you know, I've already lost you. I've already gone through the process of thinking you were dead and grieving you, and I'm not going to do that again. Being a living donor is not a small deal. I don't want you to be doing this because you feel guilt for what happened to Paul. It wasn't your fault, and it wasn't. Uh, Stitch kind of said the same thing about, you know, D Dylan's reason for wanting to do this. Are you wanting to be a donor because of what happened with Sully? You weren't able to save Sully's life, and now you want to try to save Paul's. I, I still don't understand about Dylan's military background. I don't understand why Dylan was presumed dead for all of those years. I mean, Avery brought it back up as well. You know, you were, I thought you were dead. Why did they think he was dead? I mean, we, the big revelation about Dylan's past and his time in Afghanistan was that he tried to save that little girl, Mara, and ran through the mountains with her, tried to save her, and he couldn't. And that was the source of his PTSD. That was the source of why he he took Connor and run, ran, but I don't understand entirely why he was presumed dead for all of those years. So if anybody knows, did I miss that? Please let me know because I'm I still feel confused about that part of his history. Um Victor <laughs> drags old Willa Ward out to the ranch to get answers from her, and surprise, surprise, she reveals that Ian can't father children, and Nikki's there, and it's a big shock. What? You know, he's said he's Dylan's father. What? How? how what? He can't. He can't father children. It. There's just this brief moment where. Willa and Victor are both kind of looking at Nikki, and it's making Nikki look kind of suspect. Like, Nikki, you don't really know who the father of this child was? It just made her look kind of bad. Um, I think it was after Willa left, Nikki reveals to Victor that the only other person that she was with at that time was Paul. And by the way, as Gary called in and reminded me uh, in my voicemail this week, Nikki gave him VD, I believe, or Paul gave her VD. Oh, I, shoot, I should have got that right. But there was a a, 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 a venereal disease storyline between those two at some point. So one of them had been with, with someone else at one point. But Nikki has to have this moment of telling Victor, oh, well, I mean, I guess if it wasn't Ian's, then it could have been Paul's. Well, why didn't you even consider, Nikki, the possibility that Dylan could have been Paul's before you went and told Dylan that he was a rape baby. Why didn't you think of that before? This is just coming up now? <laughs> I don't understand. Why didn't you think of that months ago, Nikki? <laughs> Why didn't Paul think of that when they were going off on this journey to find the father of Nikki's long lost son? They didn't, they didn't click with them as they're staying in that hotel room together? It didn't click with them? That, oh yeah, we slept together at that time. <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, that feels like a twist that wasn't planned from the beginning. That, felt, that feels like a tacked on twist. Um, Dylan ends up learning that he's not a viable candidate for the transplant uh, with Paul because of his war injuries. I don't know what that means. Again, it just still feels like there's something missing in Dylan's past that I'm not picking up on. Um, d after Nikki learns this truth that Paul might be Dylan's father, she doesn't have confirmation. Um, Lord knows these people have never heard of a paternity test. <laughs> they just assumed it. Um, <laughs> Nikki um, goes to the club and Dylan is at the club at the same time. He's just learned that he won't be able to be a donor to Paul and Dylan tells Nikki and this should be a moment where she's feeling crushed that it's uh, another um, uh, feeling of hopelessness for Paul's recovery. But there's just this brief, brief moment where Nikki's looking at Dylan for the first time and I swear she seemed to be looking at him trying to figure out if he could be Paul's son, trying to figure out if maybe they shared some features, if there was a resemblance there. And I loved it. It was just so, so brief. But the way she was staring at him was um, remarkable. She decides not 
to tell him. She doesn't want to tell him the truth. Later, by the way, she goes home talking to Victor. Victor can't help but saying, well, uh, you know, Nikki, sometimes you can't tell your kids things. Sometimes there are things that they need to have kept from them. And Nikki says, okay, I get your point. <laughs> <laughs> She's moved out on Victor because he didn't tell Nick about Cassie lookalike and everything he did. And, you know, maybe, you know, now he's saying maybe there are some justifications for not being completely honest. And Nikki says, all right, I take your point. <laughs> And then, of course, she tells him she loves him. She doesn't forgive him. An annoying little moment where she says, you know, I don't forgive you for what you did to Nick and Sharon. And, and Victor says, I don't give a damn if you forgive me or not. I don't care. I don't need your forgiveness for that. <laughs> How rude. So it's, they sort of left that whole, this whole breakup, the last breakup that Nikki and Victor had, they left it at Nikki saying, I don't forgive you. And Victor basically saying, I don't really care. But they kiss and make up anyway. Nikki tells him that he that she wants to move home and she does was there ever any doubt for a moment that Nikki and Victor would get back together stop toying with me YNR enough with the Nikki Victor breakup storylines it's just not believable they're gonna get back together we already all know it they're at a point in their lives where we should be over this let them be happy happily ever after please <laughs> I beg of you um Dylan ends up going to Ian a little later in the week, in the week, thinking, oh, well, I can't be a donor for Paul, but if I have this rare blood type, then that means my father must have this rare blood type too. So he goes to Ian asking him to do something good and be a donor, and Ian just says flat out, nope, sorry, son. Sorry, son. Uh, Dylan just chalks it up to, oh, this is an evil guy. But the other person who knows uh, Ian's secret is Leslie. Apparently Ian uh, confided that to Leslie, I think way back when he was in jail. I kind of, I do remember that. Uh, so he, Leslie knows the secret that Ian has known all along that he's not Dylan's father. I mean, Ian straight up calls Dylan son during that interaction. I'm not sure how Ian is going to explain this when it all comes out. I'm sure he's going to write it off as like, everyone is my son, and everyone is my daughter, and that's why I called him son. I mean, he's, it's, not, it's like Ian wants to tell, he wants everyone to know, or he's been dangling this this information you know, for, for several weeks about the secret. I don't know how he's going to deal with everyone when the truth comes out, particularly Dylan, but uh, Leslie decides that she can't hold in this secret any longer. She goes to Nikki. Nikki's obviously not surprised, but Leslie informs uh, Nikki that there was another paternity case or another lawsuit against Ian where it was revealed in court that he can't have children. So that confirms that Ian can't possibly be Dylan's father and there's this moment of realization between Leslie and Nikki that it must be true. <laughs> must be true. The same way it must be true that Ian was Dylan's father. It must be true. So they, that it, they, they realize together that there's no reason that Dylan can't be told, no reason that Paul can't be told. Um, and Nikki is torn apart by this. She loves Paul and he's fighting for his life. And she's also realizing that Paul may die, never knowing that he actually does have a son. He has always had a son. Um, so, gosh, there is... Um, also this um, moment a little bit before all that happened where Christine is finally at Paul's bedside and she is asking him to open his eyes, begging him to open his eyes so that they can continue on with their lives so that she can have a child with him as well. She doesn't know that he has this other kid hanging around out there, but she really wants to move forward with their lives and their plans and uh, Father Todd shows up on the scene this week and he looked good very wise he's got the gray beard looking a little look a little older you know but but very very wise <laughs> and um he talked to christine he's really been um talking with everyone there at the hospital he had a 
a, a really nice conversation with Michael. I, I do feel that, um, you know, Michael is Paul's best friend. I liked seeing Michael there. I loved seeing Father Todd and Michael together talking about how Paul was as a child, how uh, he, he's become the kind of man that he's become, and how Father Todd is so proud of his little brother, and Michael has come to rely on Paul, um, not only for what he's done for him, but for what he's done for Lauren. And everyone is really looking to him for spiritual answers. And I thought it was a really um, good and timely moment to have that conversation, uh, especially since we just recently passed the year anniversary of Gene Cooper, Catherine Chancellor's death. Um, it was good to see Corbin Burnson. Um, that was his mother. He's coming back onto the show and he's offering a little bit of spiritual advice here, telling Michael and in some ways telling the audience just to have faith in God's plan. Uh, it's, it's, uh, everything happens for a reason. And as that sort of winds to a close, uh, Father Todd is having a, uh, conversation with Paul, who's in this hospital bed, and he's, realizing that Paul is starting to slip away and he becomes afraid that it's time for last rites and he calls everyone together for last rites and everyone's like no I mean everyone has known that the time is counting down that Paul doesn't have that much longer to live if he doesn't get this transplant so um Nikki is put again it's I think Christine was missing during that scene where Father Todd's bringing everyone Everyone together for last rites, uh, but Nikki's allowed to have a moment alone in the hospital room with Paul, and she's hovering over him, talking to him, encouraging him to come back, and begging him to stay alive. She finds a way to tell him, you know, that you have to stay alive because I have to tell you, you have a son. That's right, Dylan is your son. And guess who's standing in the background as Nikki's finally revealing this a bombshell truth to Paul. Of course, that's right, Dylan. He's standing there in the background. He's heard everything. What a way to find out <laughs> who your father is. I mean, on his deathbed. I, I can only imagine what Dylan has, he's been through a lot. He's been through a lot with the war. Uh, he's gone through a lot and having this idyllic childhood and this wonderful relationship with, with his parents only to find out that he's uh, Ian's ward's son and then only to have, you know, th starting to settle into maybe this um, unlikable version of himself or, or accepting that maybe he's got some badness inside of him only now to have that up here. I, I, I'm sure that it's very difficult for him. Part of me thinks he should be elated. It is certainly better, probably a hundred times better, to be the son of a dying police chief upstanding guy rather than the son of a completely healthy cult leader. Summer and Austin are in that dingy motel room post-coitus. Summer has just lost her virginity to this boy who she insists is just misunderstood. He's just misunderstood. No one understands him like I understand him. I'm sure you're the first person in the world to ever think that, Summer. It makes me feel ill to, to watch this girl fawning over a guy who she really knows nothing about. She's been close with him. Even let's assume it's why in our time, let's assume she's been close to him for a month. Let's even give it that, because it hasn't been that long. She really doesn't know anything about him. Why is her loyalty with him and not with her aunt and the rest of her family? Everyone telling her, I mean, now and in the future, that this is a bad idea to become involved with him, knowing what he did? Why is she that desperate? I, I'm not feeling summer lately. I, I don't know why. I, I find it, I, I'm finding it more and more difficult to believe that she's innocent, the innocent little girl virgin that we, oh, oh, you know, that we're being led to believe that she is. It just doesn't 
translate for me. She doesn't come off as innocent and virginal. Um, she looked very, very cute this week. I love the little uh, t-shirt with the that she had on with the overlay of black lace. She looked really cute, um, but she just, like, the attitude, the way she, her, who she is annoys me <laughs> right now. Uh, she decides to get up and take a shower after they've had sex, and as soon as she gets out of the shower, they're going to keep on the run, even though Austin has told her more than once that it's not a good idea, that she shouldn't be running away with him. He's no good. He's going to get caught or have to be on the run forever, and she's willing to throw away her entire life for this boy that you met a month ago. What an idiot. I'm sorry, but what an idiot. It, k it kills me. I mean, maybe that's what youth is. Maybe that's what young love is. Maybe I'm too, I'm too far along down the line and distanced from that part of my life to be able to connect with it, but oh yeah, yeah. I she gets in the shower, and he flips on the TV uh, while she's preoccupied, and Austin sees on the news that Paul is in critical condition. Uh, he knows that they uh, they said on the news that you know this guy Austin may be with Summer Newman, so he realizes that it's not just him at this point. He's dragged her into this problem that he's created all on his own and he gets up and leaves, which was so obvious that that was going to happen the second she said she was going to shower, that he wasn't going to be there when she got out of the shower. The second she got out of the shower, uh, she hears a knock on the door. She, she realizes that Austin's gone, but hears a knock on the door, goes to open it, and it's cops because... You know, cops just knock on the door when there's a potential dangerous criminal inside, armed and dangerous. I mean, for all they know, Summer could be being held hostage. Just, that was the, the whole, it was ridiculous. It was dorky. It was really dorky. But um, at some point, uh, I mean, J Nick and Jack are worried sick about where Summer could be. At some point, she, Summer gets onto the phone uh, with them. They're at the police station, and everyone's trying to convince her to just come home and not deal with this Austin thing anymore. And as she's on the phone with Nick, I want to say it was, um, Austin comes to the General City Police Station and he decides to turn himself in. So... He is in custody. It's okay for Summer to come back, which she does. Um, but Austin is defeated. He realizes there's nothing he can do for himself. He waives his right to an attorney, offers a full confession, and just lays himself out for the slaughter. And of course, as soon as Summer gets back into town, she tells him he can't do that. You know, even though Avery is his victim, Summer convinces Avery to defend him. He's going to need a lawyer. How the heck is that even possible? Avery's the prosecution star witness and she's going to defend this kid? Unheard of. <laughs> Hire him a lawyer. Like, if you really feel that bad, give him Leslie or something. You know, if you really think he does, he he deserves to have the, the, the fair trial, help him get an attorney. But Avery, you do not have to do this. Summer, I think, guilted Avery into it. I, I can't imagine how awkward that would have to be for Avery. But Summer tells Avery, confides in her that, you know, it's gone very far between her and Austin. It's not just that they're friends and she cares about him. They had sex. Summer tells Avery that that's how serious it is. She's had sex with this criminal kid. <laughs> and it's not even just that he did this crime. It's that he's clearly deeply disturbed and has had this deep dis. Disturbable. <laughs> it's not a word. Disturbable is not a word. He's had this deep disturbance <laughs> deep down in him for a long time that made him do this. It's not just what he even physically did on the surface. Anybody can make a mistake, although, that granted, that's a pretty big mistake. He's obviously got some kind of fundamental mental issue, and Summer had sex with him, and now Avery has to get roped into defending this guy. Ugh! It's, it's so... Blah. <laughs> it's blah. Um, I got a voicemail from uh, Gary. <laughs> 
with a genius comment. I mean, it was nothing short of genius scary. I'm gonna leave you guys on this note because that's how good it was. Gary said, maybe Summer will find herself pregnant with the twist that she actually knows who the father is. Mariah has a run-in with Ian Ward this week, and I almost forgot about their connection. <laughs> I forgot that they knew each other previously. I don't know how deep that connection is, but just wait until Nick finds out about that. Everybody is just waiting to pounce on Mariah and to show her, I mean, everybody but Sharon is ready to show her for what she really is, um, and it's not going to be good when all that comes out. Ian does try to talk Mariah into essentially bilching, bilking that uh, connection with Sharon for all it's worth. Like, try to take as much advantage of that situation with Sharon as you can. She's got money. You know, she's a good mark. All of that is going on just as Sharon is asking Nick to move in with her. So their relationship is progressing as things with Mariah are kind of devolving. The situation at the underground is intense. Nobody wants Mariah to work there except for Sharon. I don't know why she wants to work there. It's obviously a powder keg. Why would she need to work there when she could work anywhere else where they're not going to be constantly suspicious of her or eyeballing her or berating her? Noah's very suspicious, as is Nick. Um, Abby decides to come marching into the underground and again just start berating Mariah, calling her Skankarella? Did she call her Skankarella? <laughs> Is that like something that's supposed to catch on? Is that supposed to be a new phrase now? I'm gonna just use it. Skankarella. I don't know. I I really don't like I don't like Abby. Um, and I really wanted Mariah to beat her down. Like, Mariah's not going to stand there and be called Skankarella for long, especially after Mariah did, whether it was genuine or not, she did go out of her way to apologize to Abby for everything that she did. She extended the olive branch to them, and Abby still comes in and treats her like she's a piece of trash. I mean, I guess it's understandable. Everything Mariah did, I, I know, I know, I know. Everything Mariah did should, there's no reason why Abby shouldn't dislike her, but I, there, all of a sudden it just gets to a boil and you know a cat fight's about to happen and Mariah just lunges at Abby. She goes right for the hair, which I was so happy about. She just yank. Like, it wasn't for the body. It wasn't for the face. It was like a true, true cat fight and that Mariah goes right for Abby's hair. I wanted Mariah to just yank it right out of her head. <laughs> I know, I'm totally biased at this point. There's no reason why Abby should like or believe Mariah. I just, I just don't like Abby. I mean, in the few, few months that we've had Mariah on the scene, I already like her more um, than, than Abby. I can't help myself. Well, anyway, um, there's this moment where Noah realizes that his wallet is missing. He's been keeping it behind the bar. Oh, yeah, because that's where you keep your wallet. You totally take your wallet out of your pants and you keep it in a public place near probably the register where a lot of other employees go. Yeah, that makes complete sense. N naturally, Everyone jumps on Mariah, assumes she show, she stole it, until Sharon shows up. And Sharon is, again, defending Mariah. I thought it was weird that Sharon revealed how she's paying Mariah's rent as well. I thought Mariah was living with Sharon, but I guess she's, she said she's paying her rent so she can, so that Mariah can pay her back the legal fees by working at the underground. It, that does not make sense to me. Is Sharon... This whole premise does not make sense. Sharon does not need the money. She does not need Mariah to work at the underground to pay her back a dime. And if you're paying Mariah's rent, Sharon, then she's just in debt to you for that too. So it's just a situation that doesn't make sense to me. As Sharon and Nick and Mariah are arguing about that, Noah and Abby go off into a corner and they have a little moment where Noah reveals that he left the wallet there behind the bar on purpose as a test to see if Mariah would take it. It was Abby who took it, took everything out of it, and 
threw it in the trash just and did it all to frame Mariah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure that Abby had every right to do it. It was a little bit sneaky, but I need to at least start trying to see things from Abby's perspective. It's just hard. She makes it hard. <laughs> um, Noah ends up confessing. I mean, the police get called and everything. Noah ends up confessing that it was just a test and it all just got out of control and Mariah's not about to be set up constantly. She quits giving Abby exactly what she wanted. I, I just don't know why I'm defending Mariah. I can't help it. I really think it's just that she reminds me of Cassie too, damn it. <laughs> can't help myself. Um, Mariah goes to the athletic club and she runs into Ian again. And Ian again encourages her to stick close to Sharon. It's pretty much the thing, the same thing he said earlier in the week, but the only difference is this time Victor overhears the whole encounter. So, my, I mean, I don't know. Their conversation implied that maybe there's more going on. I my I just my question to you guys is to what extent are Ian and Mariah involved? Is Mariah still working an angle with Sharon? And if so, is it just about money or is it part of some kind of larger maniacal evil plan? Billy and Chelsea are in Australia posing as reporters so that they can get into Stitch's ex-wife's apartment and talk to her, try to get the goods from her. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Billy and Chelsea are both trying to look the part of reporters, and Billy's solution to this is to wear a 1950s style reporter's hat. <laughs> Like he all like if he really wanted to take it to the next level, he could put a little get a little card, write the word press on it, and stick it in the bill of the hat. <laughs> It's so over the top. Chelsea uh, also is dressing the part by wearing thick black glasses. Okay. <laughs> Way to go, guys. You're undercover. <laughs> um, I've been very impressed with Chelsea this whole week. She is talking to Jenna using the mom-to-mom -mom approach to get her to open up. She tells her about Adam's death and that she's raising a child all on her own too and tries to get Jenna to talk about what it is exactly that her ex-husband did that is that he's not in their life anymore and it seems like Jenna is almost there she's almost ready to open up completely but she knows that these people are strangers she has a sense that something is up uh, Billy and Chelsea leave for the day, come back to see Jenna again, and Jenna completely knows that she that they're lying. She's been tipped off. Um, Billy made the mistake of telling Kelly that he was going to Australia. Kelly tells Stitch, and Stitch calls Jenna, telling her, you know, these people are going to be asking you some questions, so you need to be beware of them. So Billy and Chelsea come back to uh, Jenna's apartment. She knows everything. They both try to beg her for the truth. Billy opens up and says, look, Stitch is becoming involved with my wife. He may have gotten her pregnant. If there's something awful in his past, I need to know about it. Please, please tell me the truth. And Chelsea says, I wasn't lying about everything I told you. I'm just here, you know, about my life. I'm here to help him. Our families are important. Uh, but everything Jenna gives is just more breadcrumbs. I don't know what the big secret is. I can't even guess at this point. Um, the only thing that Jenna really said was that Kelly isn't innocent, but whatever it is that Ben did was awful. And it's so awful, she doesn't want it getting out. After Billy and Chelsea leave with no information, no more information than they had when they got there, uh, there's a moment where Jenna and Stitch talk on the phone 
and Jenna tells him, you know, whatever it is that he did, it's it's so awful. She doesn't want it getting out there. Uh, if anybody finds out what he, it was he she you know he did, that is she's just gonna have to get up and move again. She tells Stitch, I don't want you to tell Victoria about what you did. If you tell Victoria what you did, she's gonna tell other people, and soon everyone's gonna know, and Max is gonna know, and I don't want it getting out. And if you do end up telling her the truth, I'm gonna take your son this time, I'm going to run further away, and you're not going to have any contact with him. So it's, it becomes yet another convenient way for Stitch to not tell the truth to Victoria about his past. At this point, I don't care if Victoria ever finds out. I just want to know. I am so tired of it being dragged out, and it's one delay after the next. I thought that Jenna's coming into Jenna coming into the show was going to finally tell us something, and now no, all sh all her presence has done is give Stitch an excuse to lie some more. It's not helping me. I feel frustrated by the storyline, not intrigued by the storyline, and it's really starting to make me dislike Stitch, and I don't want to dislike Stitch. He has this, like, all of a sudden I'm seeing this sinister look in his eyes every time we turn around, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust him or not. I don't know if I want him with my Victoria, who I've known forever. <laughs> I know that I want more Billy and Chelsea, though. That is the one thing I know for sure I'm loving it. I mean, Chelsea is coming off so cool to me right now. She's coming off more like a con now, like a con artist now, than she ever ever did. I actually believe it. She's cool and she's calm and she's independent and she's leading the way. She's leading Billy around with, with his tie in her hand. I like that. I actually like Chelsea this week. I can't even believe what the words are coming out of my mouth, but it's wonderful. And there is this little scene after they've failed where they are just chatting and Billy is talking about how much he loves Victoria and he loves everything about her and Billy's giving this really wonderful, really great speech about how, you know, he, about the way that they fell in love and, and how it means to stay up late on the phone talking to someone, knowing that you're going to be tired for work in the morning, but you don't care, but it's completely worth it. And I, I connected in with what he was saying there. And, and can't everybody, I mean, hasn't everybody had that moment where you're ta you're so intrigued by this new person and you're just, you know, talking, 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 and you want to learn everything about them right away. And it, you know, forces you almost into insomnia. You can't sleep. And uh, it's, it's just, it was such a great, great speech. And Chelsea's listening to him talking about all this. And she just leans over and kisses him out of the blue, which I wanted to too. I was just like, Oh, this is such a great speech. And then she kissed him and I was like, oh, that's so great. They're kissing. I was loving it. I'm loving Billy and Chelsea. It's so good. And, I, and I'm and i so just disappointed that it's going to change. The dynamic is going to change. I don't know who this... Uh, recasted person is um, I, I I think he's older he's an older than he's older than Billy certainly so I, I don't think they're gonna that YNR is gonna pursue this connection between Billy and Chelsea and I don't know why because it totally works <laughs> I mean they, they both explain the kiss away very very quickly she's lonely thinking of Adam he's lonely thinking of Victoria but do you think there was more to it you guys do you think that Chelsea was feeling for him I mean she did have that scene last week Week where she was listening to him saying all these nice things about her while he thought she was asleep. Is it possible that she's, you know, starting to ha develop actual feelings for Billy? They do share a son. Um, she eyeballed him out right away in Myanmar when they first met. So uh, is it possible? Um, I don't know. You guys will have to let me know what you think about that. Now, meanwhile, um, they're kind of deciding that if they're not able to get information about from Jenna about Stitch, the next best thing is to get information about Kelly. Kelly somehow very intimately involved in whatever went down in their marriage and whatever and it ultimately broke them up. We all know this. They're starting to realize that maybe Kelly is the key. Uh, and by the way, back in Genoa City, Jack is confronting Kelly about why she would warn Stitch that Billy was going to Australia. Why? 
why are you involved in this? And Kelly has said over and over, she's not going to lie to Jack if, if she's confronted, you know, if he asks her a direct question, but she still finds a way to skirt the truth. I, I, I'm not feeling Kelly, to be honest with you. I'm feeling her less and less every week. I sort of forced myself to kind of get into the Jack and Kelly romance, but she she's just fallen off my radar. Something about her seems very cold to me, um, very, just, I can't, I'm not connecting with her, and it, it also kind of just does bother me that YNR seems to just always, like, lately, ever since Jill Farrenfeld, sorry, but ever since she took over the show, and I'm not, like, I don't, dislike Jill Farrenfeld's. I don't particularly know her at all, but I mean, ever since she took over the show, we're constantly Skyping uh, or sniping actors from other shows. Like, just because the woman who plays Kelly now was good on All My Children or whatever other show she was on, doesn't mean she's a good fit for Y&R. I would rather have actors who I don't necessarily know. Like, her cred on other soaps means zero to me. I only watch Y&R and Bold and the Beautiful a little bit, but not even for that long. So, um, yeah, I just, I'm having a hard time connecting with her. I would have rather kept the old Kelly. I realize it was her choice to leave, but, um, yeah, I don't know. She's bugging me right now. You guys tell me if you're feeling that way, too. Uh, I, I just wonder if I'm ever going to be able to love her. I don't know what it would take to make me love her, because YNR pulled out all of the tricks, you know? They they try to give you the quirky love scenes and all of the little quirks about the character, and that's supposed to make you identify with them and want more of them, and I, in, in truth, they've done that, and I'm not loving her. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of her involvement with Stitch. I'm not loving him either. I don't know. But after a talk uh, at the hospital with Father Todd, Stitch goes into the chapel and he's talking to God and he's saying that whatever it was that he did, he doesn't regret his actions. He regrets that it hurt people. I just don't know. I mean, I thought, well, okay, he's a doctor. Is it possible he took Max off of life support or something? Like, Kelly's son off of life support? Could he, have, like, pulled the plug on this little kid or something to save him from suffering? Or I don't know. And I'm tired of guessing. <laughs> I really am. Stitch was it's, it's, again, it's him just about to op open up, and, you know, this is a tangent, but this is the same reason why I don't, I didn't like watching Days of Our Lives. I watched Days of Our Lives for a very brief period in the 90s, and ultimately, I fell off because they drag everything out way too long. YNR at least has done, you know, a fairly good job of keeping things paced. They don't insult my intelligence by constantly keeping me hanging on to storylines like that, but it, it's happening right now and it's bothering me right now. I mean, just as Stitch is getting ready to reveal whatever it was he did, Victoria walks in in the background. It's it's a lot of that. It's a lot of, oh, I'm going to almost tell you, and then something interrupts it, and it's getting annoying. <laughs> Obviously from my tone. <laughs> uh, so whatever, Victoria walks in, Stitch turns around, and he grabs her and tells her that he loves her, and... I think the only one that's happy in this whole situation is Victor. <laughs> Victor uh, couldn't have had a moment with Stitch earlier in the week, and he tells him he knows he's the fa he, he's the, the potential father of the next Newman heir, and Victor's very happy about that. Oh, he hopes that Stitch is the father, not Billy, not that no good Billy Abbott, that Billy boy. You know, he thinks he Victor sees you know, Stitch is oh he's a doctor. He's a he has a military background. He's the man that Vic, that he's always wanted to. Victoria. I mean, Victor is, I think, more in love with Stitch than Victoria is. Victor's basically like, you know, I don't, I don't care what you did in your past, Stitchy Witchy. That's, I love you. I love you so much. Let's be besties. Let's just be boxing buddies together forever. <laughs> I'll do anything for you, Stitch. Don't ever leave me. I mean, Victoria. Neil is still sticking to his proposal to Hillary. Hillary gave him an out and he didn't take it. She said, you know, we don't have to go through with this, but he insists that he loves her. She says she'll marry him and he gives her a ring. So he's been planning this. I mean, they both seem very happy, but I just can't see this lasting. Am I being cynical? Is it just me? It just, it doesn't feel like a lasting romance to me. It feels like an interim 
romance to me. But uh, Lily and Kane are talking about this whole issue, and I really liked the scene where Lily said, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to fight this hard against my dad and Hillary. Like, I don't want to be this person. I don't want to be this person who's constantly fighting, you know, this woman. Like, I don't want to be this caddy. And I really connected with that, because I think Lily's r realizing how she's looking from the outside, and Kane said, you know, he had some great advice. He said, don't give Hillary this attention. Just don't give it to her. She's not worth it. It's good It's, it's good advice uh, for anyone, really, in any situation. So Lily kind of comes to the conclusion that she's not going to continue to fight this. Um, now, this is all happening just as Leslie's husband makes an entrance, makes his grand entrance onto the scene. He's a doctor. Uh, he's the doctor who ended up telling Dylan that he can't be a donor uh, for, uh, for Paul. I, you know, it was a little disappointing because I was kind of thinking, wouldn't it be great if Leslie's husband, like, somehow turned out to be Ian Ward? Like, Leslie got brainwashed. For some reason, I didn't take it at face value that Leslie just found a guy she liked better than Neil. <laughs> That's the truth. She wanted to get married. She wanted to fall in love. Uh, it just wasn't with Neil. So... There's this scene after Hillary and Neil have become engaged uh, at the coffee house where they run into Leslie and her husband. I can't think of his name. Shoot, I should have wrote that down, but I didn't. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of tension in the air. Leslie realizes that they're engaged, and she thinks Neil's just asking for some danger. Um, there was a, you know, a, a meeting. Neil and Leslie's husband kind of shook hands, and it was awkward but cordial. And I just thought, oh, Neil, meet your new rival <laughs> and Hillary meet yours. Clearly Leslie is gonna get up in that. She's not just gonna let this go and I, it's not necessarily that she still is in love with Neil but she also doesn't want to see him get hurt. Leslie's the one who helped Neil realize that Hillary was the one who was tormenting his family not even that long ago. So I don't know. Um, Neil, after that, goes to see uh, Lily to give her the news of engagement, and she, it's, it was actually just after she told Neil that she's done fighting. She said, you know, I'm done fighting your relationship, and Neil says, oh good, because we're getting married. Oh, the look on Lily's face was epic. It was crushed. She's just, she's, she's just come to a point of acceptance and then it's just a one-two punch right in the gut. I mean, the idea of her dad marrying Hillary. I mean, her mom's up on a pedestal and, the, and he's marrying Hillary. Ugh. Maybe Leslie will cause some problems there. Or Devon. <laughs> Oh, Devon finds out from Kane that Neil and Hillary are getting married and Kay, you know, Devon realizes something needs to be done. He better hurry up because Neil's ready to tie the knot right now. He tells Hillary, let's get married right now in the park, like tomorrow. <laughs> and she agrees. So Kane tells Devon, and so you need to speak now or forever hold your peace. You really don't have a choice. I mean, do you want to spend the rest of your life pining over your stepmother? <laughs> Woo! So, Devon calls Hillary, has her meet him in the park where she's going to get married soon, and he tells her, you can't marry Neil you, because you'd be better off with me. And they have this kiss, and there's this little, little tiny spark of chemistry, little tiny spark for me of hope. I just wanted to mention a couple of other really quick side sort of things. Uh, first of all, casting news. Ashley is coming back. Yay! Apparently, Eileen Davidson has signed a contract to be in Genoa City more. She's going to be coming back, I suppose, in September, which is seems like a long way away, but she's still, I guess, working on days. I guess she's working on both soaps. She's just so good. I can't wait to find out. Maybe she'll get up in Kelly's business. <laughs> Maybe she'll ferret that out and teach her a lesson or two or something. I don't know. That'd be a good rivalry. I'll, uh, 
Ashley versus Kelly. That'd be good. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is because is that I I want to say I think YNR is doing a really good job right now with the score. Have you guys noticed that the music is excellent lately? I think that they they've really got the intro down, where you know you get your first set of opening scenes, and then they play the the theme song just over the tail end of the beginning set of scenes, and it transitions beautifully into the credits, and it's just, it, it's, it swells in just the right way, and I, it just, it's caught my attention several times over the past couple weeks, and I haven't had a chance to notice it, but it was really good this week, and also, they seem to have done a newer version of the YNR song, of Nadia's theme, uh, I, they, I don't, I think it was at the hospital, I want to say maybe it was Chris and Paul, maybe Chris at Paul's deathbed side, but they played sort of a new, and maybe it was when Father Todd was in there with her, but they overplayed this kind of new version with, you know, the classic melody, the classic YNR melody, but it had some different uh, effects in there. It was sort of a newer, uh, a newer version of it. It was beautiful. Did you guys notice that? I thought it was good. I like to mention the good things that they do, because I know I, I mentioned the bad things. And, I, you know, I'm also noticing I haven't had a chance to talk about a lot of new scenery. I mean, there's a lot there. You know, we mentioned, shoot, I mean, six months, a year ago, that it does feel like Genoa City is in its little bubble of indoor scenes. We don't see as much of what's going on outside, and we're getting a lot more of that now. We're seeing external, a lot of external pictures of the building. We got the new underground that we see. Um, everybody's house now has an exterior shot. But not only that, there are shots of the city, shot, you know, aerial shots, shots of the park, shots of people running through the park, and I wanted to find out what you guys think about that. Um, I, I have to say, when I originally brought this up a year ago, it, it was because I had kind of gotten back into the bold and the beautiful and noticed how they do such a good job of doing actual outdoor scenes and really taking you to L.A. I think what the difference is, is that with bold and the beautiful, they're in an actual city. I mean, they can easily go out and get shots of LA and make you believe that you're there. Genoa City is different. It doesn't actually exist in the same way. I mean, Genoa City, Wisconsin exists, but it's nothing like <laughs> what we portray in YNR. And, and I just, I'm wondering if, if you guys are feeling more a part of Genoa City. Do you have a better sense of Genoa City as a result of these new scenes? Because I kind of don't. Mm, I mean, it's almost like I've spent so much time imagining it all in my head that now having it presented to me has thrown me off a little bit. But it's, it, it seems generic. Like, the scene of some runner running through the park doesn't add anything to my viewing experience. I mean, they can throw in all of the bumper scenery that they want, and that doesn't make it feel like home, you know? I mean, we spend a whole lot of time in Genoa City, let's be real. I mean, five hours a week watching the show. If you're watching this, you watch an extra hour of YNR. We spend a lot of time in Genoa City, so uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't feel like it's added as much to my viewing experience. And if you don't feel the same way, I'd love it if you let me know. If you do kind of feel that same way, what would be better? Let's offer a suggestion here. Like how, what could they do to make it feel more like home? And the one thing I can think of is I would, act, I would like to see some actual outdoor shots. They're filming in LA. So they have the ability to, or I'm mean, presumably, they have the ability to go shoot at an outdoor cafe or something, at least maybe once or twice, just a couple of scenes of getting that feeling of breeze, you know, coming through the, the actor's hair and, you know, just feeling like you're kind of having, I mean, the whole point of this is they're, they, it's been inside. Everything of Genoa City we've seen inside. They're trying to take it outside and give us a sense of the city. So why not just shoot some outdoor shots? Or why cannot? Why can't we just see a shot of Peter Bergman maybe walking around outside in a park, like an actual outdoor shot, rather than generic shots of the city? Why not get like go out and 
take, take, sh shoot Peter Bergman wa walking down the street for a stroll. Like that would make me feel more like, oh, it's not two separate things. It's not the inside or the outside. It's, oh, these characters exist in a world outside of the scene, the indoor scenes that we see. So that's my suggestion. <laughs> You guys let me know what your suggestions are. I'm really interested to read them. Speaking of comments, I don't always do the world's best job, I mean really within the past several months, of responding to all of my comments. Uh, I f seem to get them in a million different ways. I get emails and phone calls and com video comments and comments on the website and I, I don't do a very good job of catching them all. Like, I feel like I need to respond to everybody and I, it, I, like, I, I do graphic design for a living. My arms like are starting to kill me. The idea of typing out emails and responses physically pains me at this point. So I thought, you know, I, I really want to acknowledge and thank everyone who leaves me comments. I know I probably tend to prefer the voicemails because it's just something I can hear and say and it's easy and it doesn't hurt my wrist or my elbow. <laughs> Um, but I, I want to acknowledge everyone who leaves comments. So I thought I would maybe try out doing a little segment of just plucking out a couple of comments that I've gotten throughout the week and uh, talk, you know reading them to you guys and seeing what you think. Um, uh, so let's start out with uh, Nippy Fan 100. Last week I had mentioned. Uh, Allie had mentioned that um, I wasn't feeling Hillary and that I kind of thought that uh, I wouldn't care if she disappeared. Nippy Fan 100 says, I don't want Hillary to leave. The actress that plays her is great and I don't think they write her good and definitely not to her potential. She's like how Sharon Case is, great actor, horrible writing. And I think, um, Nippy Fan, that that does hit on something that I'm identifying in myself. It's not that the actress who plays Hillary is bad. It's that I don't think I've had a chance to really connect in with the storylines. She was brought on as a villainess and we went through a brief transition where she was persecuted by everyone and was trying to make herself better and trying to become a, a better member of society. And then they just pushed her right into this relationship with Neil that feels so mismatched uh, that I couldn't help but jump on Lily's side and therefore sort of feel anti-Hillary. But I do think if we get her out of that relationship with Neil and maybe put her into a romance with Devon, that would help me like her a little bit better. I want to see how she acts because there is also still a part of me that is suspicious about her. Um, and the other thing Nippy Fan mentioned is, uh, and this is a good point, it's funny how Lily didn't care about the age difference when she got with Kane and everyone else did. Lily was 19 and Kane was 32. I totally forgot about that. So that's a really good point. There is an age difference there, too. And maybe it's just that, I mean, really, it's about the same, like 10 years or so. What's the age difference between Hillary and Neil? It can't be that much more. Um, Granati and Candy mentions on YouTube, Neil's proposal was the worst. <laughs> This man really do fall in love. It's true. It's true. Um, he is, he's always in love, but not for long. He can't cultivate a long-term relationship. It seems like Neil loves love, but he's not able to follow through with any of it. I mean, why does he need to meet Hillary, fall in love, and then marry her all in this quick time span? It's because I think he knows his affection is a ticking time bomb. It's good. It's, it's, it's not good gonna last. It seems to never. Um, Karen Ferguson mentions, I think this was on YouTube as well, for the first time ever I warmed up to Christine. I've also never really felt irritated at Nikki before now, uh, along with the string of incidents where Chris got blown off for Nikki's dilemmas, especially the takeout dinner waste. I was miffed that Nikki said, I'll let you know about Paul's state. I know she was trying to be nice, but I can see why a grief-stricken wife would want Nikki out of there. Yeah! <laughs> I agree, <laughs> Karen Ferguson. I think Nikki's heart is in the right place. She loves Paul. They're very good friends. But she needs to step back and give some, give some deference to, uh, to Christine. Connor called into my voicemail last Saturday and said the same thing. Nikki crossed the line. Um, Chris has been very patient. But again, Nikki should have deferred. 
Um, Linda Scott, uh, I, I want to say this was on YouTube too, says Chris versus Nikki should be interesting. I wonder if Chris won't get pregnant now, uh, which would be even harder on Chris. Victor's going to be jealous also. Hope we get some scenes between the Baldwins and Paul, even though the story is about Dylan. They're his best friends and have been for now, for years now. So speaking of the Baldwins, they need a storyline or at least some decent screen time. Yes, yes, yes. We were inundated, Linda Scott, with the Baldwins and the Carmine and they were all up in our screen every single day and then they just sort of disappeared after Lauren's pregnancy scare so uh, I agree I would like to see some more uh, scenes with 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 Michael and uh, especially with Paul in the hospital um Bobby on Facebook also sent me a message and said Michael needs a storyline the chat with Father Todd was uh, was it was awesome um, but but uh, Bobby says the chat with Father Todd my Michael kind of came off as an atheist. I thought, well, you know, that's a really good point, because if we dig into that conversation between Michael and Father Todd, it was Father Todd saying, you know, even if I lose my brother, I accept that, because I believe that God has a plan, and Michael had this position of, where's your God now? If God takes your brother, what's he, you know, where, what, where is he now? And, and I think that's interesting. I don't know if it's necessarily Michael coming off as specifically an atheist, but I think it showed Michael's lack of faith or <clears throat> Michael's wavering faith, uh, which uh, definitely gives us a little bit of an insight into his character. I think Michael has pretty much always been a little bit more cynical, a little more skeptical, a little bit more on the dark side. Michael's never really uh, struck me as a, a man of faith or a godly man, but I think it's a, a certainly a good, uh, a very good point, and that was a good scene. I want to see scenes like that, as, you know, Linda had mentioned, you know, the Baldwins, we need to see them. That was really quite a treat. Um, Aaron Brody had said on YouTube, I'm so tired of Adam in his hand! <laughs> How can he be so, you know, pissed off, I think is what this is, when he's out there hiding about killing Gordelia? Cordelia. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Aaron goes on to say, I thought he was supposed to be confessing. Why is he hiding behind some creepy camera like a sick stalker? Why doesn't he come clean for the murder he did? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's because YNR can't cast him. I mentioned a couple weeks ago about that rumor that Michael Mooney might be coming back. I've heard nothing else about it. Why, why do these rumors swell up and then go away? Um, and why was Michael Mooney on set? Maybe he was picking up a check. <laughs> Maybe it was simply that he was picking up a check and the fans grabbed hold of that like a piece of meat and, and, and tore it apart. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, you guys have to let me know what you think about this comment segment. This is by no means all of the comments that I received, and I apologize. I'm, I mean, I can't read every single one, but uh, I just wanted to kind of pluck out some ones that worked with what I was talking about this week. So if you like me reading comments, let me know. If you don't care for it, um, let me know either way. I'm curious to know how you feel about maybe me reading some of my feedback throughout the week. Uh, I, I'm also kind of working on potentially doing uh, the video portion in a different place. Uh, I know and the old wicker chair has definitely had its days. <laughs> this chair is getting a little raggedy uh, and, and it, I'm kind of thinking about maybe doing uh, my vlog portion and the, and the podcast recording in a different area of the house, maybe a little more homey, bring you guys more into my home and, and uh, could be a little bit easier, a little bit more cash. I know I tend, <clears throat> the place where I'm doing this right now uh, is is, uh, it's, I have some issues with echo, so I find myself shouting a lot, and I don't want to be that person that's like shouting at you. Sometimes I'll listen back to the podcast especially, and I'll hear myself yelling, and I'm like, why am I yelling? <laughs> I get so into the show that I start screaming. I'm kind of thinking about maybe bringing it to a little bit more intimate, uh, a little bit more intimate place. So I'm kind of working on that. Um, nothing is going to happen right away, but um, that's definitely something that I'm sort of planning and testing into the future. So something different to look forward to, too.
Okay, everybody. <laughs> that is it for me for this week. I have, I, this, I assume, I think this is going to be an extra long version to make up for my half hour vlog last week. I felt bad about that. So I'm trying to bring you some, some more length, some more meat here. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed it. And I hope that you guys leave me comments. Like I said, there's a million different ways for you to leave comments. You can go to my website at yrchat.com. You can leave comments <clears throat> here in the YouTube videos, you can go to Facebook, go to Twitter, um, sh shoot, there's a million different ways. Call, you can call my voicemail, it's area code 309-588-4569. Uh, all that stuff is available through the website. You can leave voicemails through the website as well, so yrchat.com. Um, that's it. <laughs> I can't wait to hear from you guys. I love you. Everybody take care and have a good week. Bye.